Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, Addressing the Fiscal Crisis in Communities Affected by COVID-19. Uh, we're so thankful to our speakers, Tammy Tawarson from National Governors Association, Ellen Nissenbaum from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, Carolina Valle from the California Pan-Ethnic Health Network, and Stan Dorn from Families USA um, for joining us today to share their insights and expertise. Um, and we're also thankful to all of you for taking the time to learn and take action in your state. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, today's presentation is being recorded. The slides and recording will be made available. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end of the presentation, so feel free to um, ask your questions at any time via the chat function. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Haney Tawarson from the National Governors Association. Great. Thanks so much. Um, so pleased to be with all of you. I'm the director of the health division here at the National Governors Association. I just wanted to spend just a minute, if you're not familiar with the National Governors Association, we are the oldest organization serving governors, and we serve all governors, so Republican and Democratic alike. Next slide, please. And there are um, two parts for NG, and the reason I just want to talk about this for a minute is because I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing, you know, on the Center for Best Practices side where I sit, but we, I'm also going to talk about our um, federal lobbying efforts, which is really coming from our Office of Government Relations. And those are two separate parts of NGA. Where I sit is um, the Director of Health in the Center for Best Practices, where we're really a think tank consultancy, supporting governors and their staff, really helping them identify you know, what are the kind of best ideas out there? What are the policies they need to understand? I'll tell you in COVID-19, we've been doing a lot of new work on areas like testing, contact tracing, understanding vaccines. Um, so really, we, we sit on the side of really developing policy and that informs what our government relations shop um, asks for from Congress. Next slide, please. So today I want to talk just a little bit about um, the crisis facing governors. And before I get into sort of state budget issues, and I know Ellen's going to talk very eloquently about this, so I won't spend too much time on this, but, but I want to just talk a little bit about, you know, COVID-19 has been an unprecedented event. It is the worst public health epidemic in 100 years, and along with it, it has brought um, severe economic strain across the state. This picture is just showing you, this is from the National Conference of State Legislators that they actually just put up here, who, which states have enacted a 2021 budget, um, which of those are two-year budgets, um, and where are the budgets awaiting governor's actions. But I wanted to just talk a little bit for a moment about um, really what, what governors are seeing across their states, as, as this is the biggest issue for them, is, is sort of their budgets and what they're facing, along with trying to handle a, a public health epidemic. So we all know, I think, you know, unemployment is a, at a historic high, and there has been a real disparate impact of COVID-19 on certain communities, communities of color in particular, um, as well as folks in long-term care facilities, so our older adults. So we have spent a lot of time at NJ thinking about how do you advise governors to target resources in the context of the epidemic knowing that they're dealing with these, these huge budget challenges, which are going to go on not just this year, but in, I think in future years, unfortunately, to come. Um, some of our economic experts who are briefing the governors, and we convene them every week, um, have told them some of your states, it'll take three to five years for you to really come back. So, you know, a lot to, to think about. Um, in the shorter term, and the Centers on Budget Policy Priorities has done some really good work on this, so I'm, I'm sure Ellen's going to talk about this in more detail than I will. But, you know, states have to balance their budgets, so governors um, are faced with pretty hard choices right now. Unlike the federal government, they have to balance their budgets. They have to find and make up for lost revenue in a one- or two-year cycle. So for some of these states, um, they're, gonna, they're, they're already seeing shortfalls and significant shortfalls um, in their state revenue, and they're going to have to find enough revenue to close those shortfalls in the short term um, for some, you know, even in the next, you know, 10 weeks or so, and then uh, across the rest of the fiscal year. So, so a couple of um, things that have been out in the news, and I think the Center on Budget Policy Priorities has also written about this, 
just to give you a sense, you know, states like Arizona expects a revenue drop by $1.4 billion. Um, Kansas estimates um, $827 million drop in revenue. New York and Colorado um, project revenue drops of 17% or more. Um, and, and these are states that many of them were looking at potential surpluses. You know, California, for example, before all of this had a surplus, and now they're expecting revenues to decline by $32 billion in just 2021. So, you know, I think thinking about how states are going to be able to survive this and the impact on the populations um, that you all think about is, is pretty significant and I think very challenging. Um, one of the things I wanted to, to note is there's a lot of different reasons for the revenue decline. I mean, there's, there's different economic drivers in states. Some states have, you know, are dependent on oil prices. Some states have tourism. Some states are looking at, you know, all of them, decreased tax collection. So all of these things combined are what's really, you know, resulting in these big shorter-term and longer-term budget shortfalls. Um, in terms of, you know, what that means for how to, to address programs, I think you'll, you've seen probably out in the press there are certain states that have already proposed big cuts. Um, for example, Ohio um, has been out there publicly saying that they have to take out hundreds of millions of dollars um, cuts um, across their programs, which, which will have a huge impact on the Medicaid program in particular. So wanted to just make sure that we talk about that as a group with all the presenters on this call, and I think that's what we're going to do. Um, one of the things I wanted to, next slide please, um, just talk a little bit about is the work that we're doing at NGA um, to help support governors through this. Um, and if you're interested in any of the things I'm talking about, we have a lot on our coronavirus website. So this is just a snapshot of that website here. Um, one of the things that we have really been focusing on through Office of Government Relations is the lobbying effort with Congress, really making sure that um, congressional members are, are well aware of, of the budget shortfalls that states are facing and the incredible economic pressure it's going to put on programs and, frankly, the, the people that are served by them. So we have been um, asking for $500 billion in um, stimulus relief in a new package. Along with that, we have asked for an increase in the federal government share of Medicaid funding um, of 12%. Um, so the combination of those two have been our, our biggest ask of Congress, and we continue, governors continue to lobby on that directly with congressional members. And I know Ellen's going to talk about that a little bit and how that fits into kind of their work and what they're doing. Um, the other thing I wanted to just note, you know, a, a couple things that are, are popping up for us. Under the last package, there was a 6.2 increase in FMAP, and along with that, states have a maintenance effort requirement, which I think ensures that people maintain coverage during this historic public health epidemic. At the same time, just in terms of how that will operate in the Medicaid program, um, that means where states will be able to make cuts is really to their provider rates. That's going to be one of their main ways they can um, impose any cuts. And that, along with what we think is going to be fairly increased enrollment in the Medicaid program, I think the Kaiser Family Foundation estimated could be up to 17 million people by January 2021. We'll see if that actually um, pans out, but that's, that's one of the estimates out there. That's going to put a lot of strain on, on the Medicaid budget. And one of the concerns that we have certainly been hearing about is the disparate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color, really seeing those high levels of cases um, along with mortality rates, combined with um, what we think is going to, you know, is already a, a pretty fragile provider network in the Medicaid program and how that's going to be impacted by things like provider cuts if that's where the states have to go because that's one of the tools that they have in their tool chest. So we are spending some time um, at NJ thinking about provider sustainability, um, different strategies that states can think about to help support certain types of providers, which would include rural providers, behavioral health providers, um, primary care providers, um, and safety net hospitals, among others. And, and one of the things I think that we um, hope to do for states is identify how to make those target investments in the context of, of budget shortfalls, which I think is going to force a lot of really difficult decisions. The other thing I wanted to just highlight for you all, um, if you're interested, at the same time during all of this, you know, governors are managing the public health epidemic. 
and they have incredible pressure to reopen because of the economic strain of all of this. And so they are reopening. And I'm sure you've all seen the reports that, you know, in certain states they are seeing an increase in cases and really a more important point in increase in hospitalizations because, of course, there's a lot more testing, which leads to more cases. And so we're spending a lot of time on um, providing some guidance on these different aspects of reopening. We have a roadmap to recovery, um, which is really a public health guide for reopening. We are tracking um, really on a daily basis different actions that states are taking to reopen, what requirements they're putting on populations. Um, so if that's of interest to you, it's on our website. We also have a series of memos that are really identifying different areas where we um, are trying to provide strategies and, and support resources to governors. So that's all on the website as well. And there are certain areas where we have talked about um, where we're going to have um, a memo, for example, on health equity and how um, the impact of COVID has, has, hit, has hit certain communities and what states can do about that and which states have task forces and what those task forces have done. So that's coming, if you're interested, probably sometime next week. That will be a new addition to our website. We also have a lot of um, resources on things like testing and how that's being prioritized for certain populations, what's happening with vaccine and treatment, um, how to really protect um, individuals in long-term care facilities and the strategies. We actually have a, a new resource on that just posted last week. And there's a tracker along with it that, that shows what states are taking in terms of actions to protect those populations. Um, we also are going to have new resources on things like child welfare, and we have a new page on school reopenings and the state states are the steps states are taking to do that. So, just wanted to be sure to familiarize yourself, you, you all, with all of the resources we have there. Um, and I just would would say I leave you with all of this as you think about you know working in your communities, um, really identifying where there are you know, smart investments the state should be making, knowing that they're going to have to make some hard decisions. I think that's where we are trying to focus our energy and attention on how to help states navigate this, because many of them are going to have to make hard choices. And, and how do you do that while you continue to protect the people in your state? So with that, I, I think I'll turn that back over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Haley. Um, and now we'll go ahead and turn it over to Ellen Nissenbaum from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Great. Thank you so much for having me. And um, really terrific to be doing this with Amy and everybody. And big shout out to families for helping to organize this. It's, it's just incredibly timely and incredibly important. Um, and thanks so much to all of you at the state level and others who are doing so much to address this terrible pandemic and, uh, and all of the implications around that. So lots to cover. Let me jump right in. We could move to the next slide maybe. Um, so I think you all don't need us to tell you this is an unprecedented fiscal crisis, but let me just underscore that I don't think the magnitude of this crisis is well understood on the Hill. We have just uh, released a paper on Monday showing that the aggregate revenue shortfall for all states over the next two years is over $600 billion. Um, and even if you took out state day rainy, rainy day funds and the COVID money, you're still talking of major shortfalls of over $400 billion. That isn't, I mean, the, the Great Recession was bad. This is like back to even before that. And at the same time, states are facing rising costs related to COVID. So it's the double whammy of having their revenues fall off the cliff and then at the same time they're having additional costs. Um, we still find that lots of people on the Hill don't know that states, with the exception of Vermont, must balance their, their operating budgets each and every year, even in the depths of a recession and an economic downturn like this. So um, really making sure that people know on the Hill that the states have to have their budgets in balance. They don't, they're not going to have the revenues that they counted on, but they're going to have higher expenses. And so there is no alternative to states making very, very tough choices and deep cuts in critical services, in laying off uh, jobs, state and, uh, jobs, and that's kind of the combination um, that is coming together. So the FMAP, um, when you talk to people up on the Hill about fiscal relief, if you're talking to the budget side of the Hill, they don't think of the Medicaid match that we call the FMAP. They don't think about it as fiscal relief. They're not familiar with the fact that in the previous two economic downturns, an increase in the FMAP temporarily to states has been one of the two, if not the main way, 
that we have provided temporary assistance to states. It is very flexible, it is very timely, and it allows states to redirect some money to avoid very deep cuts uh, and changes at the budget in other areas if they need to do that. It also obviously helps states with their, with their higher Medicaid costs. What is frustrating, I think, for those of us that have been around and remember back to the 03 recession and then the Great Recession in 09, is that every time we have an economic downturn, we have to go back to Congress and get a bipartisan agreement to try to provide fiscal relief to states. And we explain to policymakers at the federal level that if the states make these layoffs and they make these budget cuts, it completely undermines everything Congress is doing to turn around the economic downturn and put the, cover, the country back on the road to recovery. So what the states do has a huge implication for the national economy, right? Um, and, and yet to have to come back each and every time when action is delayed, it's a huge amount of uncertainty in states. So what do we really need to put in place in the long run? What we really need is an automatic, permanent counter-cyclical FMAP. We'd argue for the same thing in unemployment and SNAP. So that when an economic downturn is beginning, not months into it or weeks into it, but when it's beginning, um, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd use economic data to confirm that, then you would automatically see a temporary boost in the FMAP. It would stay in place until, you know, whatever the legislation says about un unemployment coming back down, and then it would automatically turn off. It would be, um, you know, states would know it would kick in. They wouldn't have to wait. They wouldn't have tremendous uncertainty. I think for Hamey and us and families and others, one of the single most frustrating things at this moment is the fact that there is a massive state budget crisis. Many states have to put their budgets into place by July 1st, and that Congress has um, no chance of acting to provide fiscal relief by July 1st. If we had a permanent stabilizer, that wouldn't be the case. And I am very, very, very excited to. Um, announce if you haven't already heard the wonderful news that Senators uh, Casey from Pennsylvania, Brown from Ohio, Cortez Masto from Nevada, and Ben from Colorado are introducing next week a permanent FMAP counter-cyclical bill. Now, why am I excited since this has virtually no chance of being included in the next COVID deal? It, it does, however, lift up the FMAP as a critical component of fiscal relief in addition to direct grants to state and local governments that is also needed. Um, and it also helps us set the table for 2021. So we'll be able to really take advantage of that to bring more attention to this. Okay, moving forward. On the next slide, please. Um, so I think everybody's familiar with this, and Amy may have covered this, um, you know, in Families First, which was super early. We had a nice little bump in the F map. We wish it covered all the expansion populations, but it didn't. Um, and that will remain in place until the end of the public health emergency. That is a designation the administration gets to make. But for a number of reasons I won't get into right now, we do not expect them to turn that off anytime soon. But it is a unilateral decision by, you know, by the administration. So the next time it comes up for renewal is July. It seems unimaginable that they would turn it off. Um, but there are a lot of things that are unimaginable these days. Um, and then they'll have to renew it again in September. So as long as that PHE stays in effect, that FMAP is in place. And of course, it is accompanied um, based on the precedent that we set in 03 and 09, that when we provide governors with extra funding for Medicaid, there's also what we think is an eminently reasonable requirement that they can't take the extra federal money and turn around and cut eligibility or impose practices that make it hard for people to get on or stay on the Medicaid program. So that what we call the MOE, the maintenance of effort, coupled with the FMAP, is really a powerful way to assist states fiscally and to protect coverage. And the FMAP also, uh, frankly, makes it um, help states, I think, avoid what, what Hemi talked about, which is um, really making deep cuts in provider payments, which obviously is a big problem. Okay, moving forward. Thank you. Okay, so this is the, um, this is the proof in the pudding when it comes to, uh, I think, the FMAP and the MOE. So when you look at the early recession in 2003, when we didn't have much of an FMAP at all, it wasn't very long, and we didn't have a super long MOE, you can see that there were eligibility cuts. They went down a little bit in 04 and 05, but there were, um, you know, eligibility provider benefits. If you look at the Great Recession when the MOE was in place, you can see that there were almost no changes on eligibility. We really were able to protect coverage um, and to some degree benefits. You can also see that, that the provider payment cuts, however, 
were there and they didn't go away. And that is because we were only able to have the FMAP in place for two years. We were not able to extend it longer, even though everybody knows that recession dragged out for much longer. So again, a permanent countercyclical FMAP probably would have done more in those out years to protect uh, provider payments as well. But proof in the pudding on the importance of the MOE and coverage. Moving forward, please. Okay, so the governors um, really put forward a tremendous proposal. I mean, huge shout out to Hamey and, the, and Governor Hogan, Governor Cuomo, and all of them. Um, and yet I would note that um, NGA, frankly, didn't toot its horn enough from my standpoint. There was a lot of attention from the governors about requesting $500 billion in direct grants to states with a clear acknowledgement that local governments also need more aid. But what many people on the Hill didn't realize for quite some period of time is that the governors, as Hemi said, also asked for an increase in, F, in the FMAP. And it is, uh, you know, it is the best FMAP, FMAP proposal I remember, you know, ever seeing at the center for my 30 plus years at the center. It was a strong boost. It would have remained in place until 2021. And it then linked the FMAP to a state unemployment rate. So it would have remained in effect for states to continue to have serious problems. The HEROES Act, as you know, has um, what I jokingly call the Stairmaster FMAP. So it takes the 6.2% and it increases that. So the total temporary increase in the FMAP would be 14%. So it adds another seven percentage points, right? And that would be in place for the state's next fiscal year, starting this July and going through next June. So it's actually not as good as NGA in some ways. It's not as long. It doesn't have the automatic stabilizer provision. Uh, but it does have two percentage points more uh, than the NGA proposal. And then um, it has $500 billion in grants just for states and more money for locals. In the Senate, we don't really have a companion stimulus bill. And at this point, neither Republican Leader McConnell nor Democratic Leader Schumer intend to unveil one, although uh, we could see McConnell lay down a proposal for the basis of negotiations. But there is a bipartisan proposal on the table, and that is called the SMART Act, introduced by uh, Republican Senator Cassidy and Democrat Menendez. Um, this is $500 billion, but unlike NGA and HEROES, this is $500 billion in direct grants shared between state and local government. So while we appreciate this bipartisan proposal, in our view, it is woefully inadequate for what they need, and it does not include any increase in the FMAP. So it is a moving the process forward, creating some good bipartisan will on fiscal relief, but falls way short of what is needed. Let's move to the next one. Hey, Ellen, can I just chime yeah. in for one minute? Um, just on the 12% just on the 12% um, increase mm -hmm. FMAP, and one thing just to share with the audience, the reason we asked for September 2021 is because governor's offices wanted more certainty around their budgets, and they know that this fiscal crisis is going to extend for for a number of years so that was just why we we put a date out there in that proposal so just wanted to add that yeah and as i said if you talk to budget staff in the senate democrat and republican alike and you say fmap they go no that's a health thing that's a medicaid thing and when you talk to health staff they don't really understand how important the fmap is for state budgets so we have a lot of work to educate on fmap 101 let alone lift up the nga proposal um, as the senate moves forward so where are we um I think until I would have said about a week ago, if you say if you said the word state fiscal relief in the Senate, um, Democrats and Republicans alike would look at you and say, oh, you mean the coronavirus relief fund? You mean those direct grants that we're going to give to state and local governments? And almost nobody would have mentioned the FMAP. I think the tide is turning a little bit. Uh, there's a letter that Senator Warner sent with about 40 Democrats uh, to Schumer and McConnell laying out a couple of health priorities. This was front and center. There are a couple of other things that have been moving forward. Uh, Senator uh, Gar Cory Gardner, Republican from Colorado, and his counterpart, the Democrat uh, Michael Bennett, did a letter on the FMAP. So it is beginning to, to get some traction. But from my standpoint, we are still way behind the eight ball in what is an ultimate goal, which is ensuring that when the Democratic and Republican leaders sit down to negotiate a deal and fiscal relief comes up, which both sides have very clearly acknowledged it is one of the top issues in July, that there is a clear understanding we need the FMAP and the grants, but not just the grants. Um, I think, you know, with all just for Kennedy, I don't think we can get either the HEROES proposal or the NGA proposal um, in total, in total. 
But I think um, continuing to cite the NGA proposal is really, really important because it really covers not just the fact that we need an increase. The, the NGA proposal really leans into the critical issue of duration. We need this FNAP bump in place as long as possible. And if we could tie it to unemployment rate, that would be great. But at least we want to have the NGA proposal of the FNAP on the table through the end of December is something people are front and center about. So there's the club principle I mentioned. Um, we want to make sure that you know that Democrat, that Pelosi and Schumer have heard from their colleagues, their providers, their governors, their Medicaid advocates that the FMAP must must be an integral part of any bipartisan agreement on COVID on the next COVID package. Um, you know we do think um, the MOE is getting a, a fair amount of discussion. Uh, a number of states have raised some concerns about the fact that the FMAP and Families First, um, excuse me, the maintenance of effort goes beyond what was in place in ARA. In the ARA legislation, the maintenance of effort said you can't cut eligibility, impose restrictive practices. Because this is a pandemic, when the maintenance of effort was put into place for Families First, there was a lot of premium put on protecting coverage. And so this MLE also says that states can't remove anybody from Medicaid during the pandemic and the public health emergency. A number of issues have come up on that. The Medicaid directors and others have noted some uh, things that they think need to be adjusted there. And so a number of Republicans in the House of Senate have indicated they want to reopen the MOE and they want to scale it back. And we can have a longer conversation about that. But I think for many of us, our collective goals right now are, are twofold. Um, really, really try to secure the biggest and longest FMAP we can and try to maintain that Medicaid MOE as much as we can to protect coverage. We can talk more about that. Okay, I think there's only one or two, one more maybe and I'm done. So next slide. Okay, so I think these are things you, you all know and we've talked about. We need to emphasize the really unfathomable, unprecedented fiscal crisis. We need to want to start lifting up. Um, I know this sounds absolutely ridiculous and crazy, but as governors put their budgets forward in the next two to three weeks, if we start to see cuts in healthcare and Medicaid, that will be the kind of ammunition and examples that we need to lift up about why states need fiscal relief and why they need the FMAP. Um, you know, we are starting to get, uh, just even in the last several days, a very disturbing push from some conservatives in Congress saying states don't need any more money. They haven't spent what they got in CARES in direct grants, and they haven't really used the FMAP, like there's still more room there. So we need to make sure that policymakers are clear that much more is needed, um, even if states haven't fully spent, you know, all the funding that they have. Um, so my computer just completely collapsed. Um, so uh, let me just try to catch up. But maybe, uh, Lauren, could you just read the next thing on there? Yeah, definitely. So, um, so really, I, I think we're seeing the key points to make. Oh, I got that, it. I'm um, sorry. I'm sorry. It came back. Oh, yeah. I got it. No problem. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I think um, again, we we want the budget people to understand that the FMAP is fiscal relief. We want the health people to really focus on it protects coverage. Remember, additional funding to state is used by states, um, and you know we all want to make sure there are adequate provider payments there. So. We really want to link the FMAP as both in critical for both fiscal relief and for protecting coverage. Um, and I think we can go back to the precedent. You know, there was bipartisan agreement in 03, and then the ARMA package had the FMAP uh, and the MOE in 09. So it, this is not a new idea to do these things. I think I'm down to my last PowerPoint. Let's see if I just slow it. Great. I think um, this is actually your last uh, slide, Ellen. Oh, great. Okay. All right. So I think we've covered it, and um, I really appreciate it and look forward to questions and discussion. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and we'll now turn it over to Stan Dorn from Families USA. Thanks so much, Lauren, and it's really a pleasure to be with you all today. I'm going to build on the amazing content that we just heard um, from our two previous speakers to focus on the dual role played by Medicaid in furnishing health coverage to people in need and in protecting our economy. Next slide, please. So Medicaid has become a fundamental part of American health care in a way that lots of people don't realize. One out of every five Americans receives their health coverage through Medicaid. Almost half of all U.S. births 
take place, covered by Medicaid, 40% of all children, 80% of poor children, and half of children with special health care needs receive their coverage through Medicaid. Almost half of all adults under age 65 with disabilities are covered by Medicaid, and more than 6 in 10 long-term care enrollees are covered by Medicaid. So what all of this means is that if Medicaid has to make major cuts because Congress doesn't step to the table with adequate FMAP and with adequate state fiscal relief, huge numbers of people all across this country are going to be vulnerable. And that's particularly the case now that we've entered economic downturn. In states that expand Medicaid, almost 40% of the adult workers receive coverage through Medicaid. In states that don't, 17%, uh, 16% enroll. So the, it, right now we are, as, as you all know, we are experiencing uh, a pandemic of highly infectious and deadly, essentially untreatable disease. Uh, and this is not the time to risk people's health coverage. If people don't have health coverage, they delay seeking care even when they start to feel sick, and that can put their survival at risk, and it also enables the virus to spread, potentially endangering others. So the health care consequences of failing to provide adequate state fiscal relief through FMAP increases and other mechanisms are just are, are really frightening to contemplate. Next slide, please. We've already seen the Medicaid program responding to laid off workers losing health coverage. Uh, it varies greatly by state. The states that have expanded Medicaid are among those that have seen large increases, as you can see from this table. And it also did not, it varies by the, the degree of commitment on the part of a state administration to get people enrolled into coverage. So North Carolina, which has done a lot of good innovative things in general, has managed to get a lot of folks on the Medicaid program despite that state's unfortunate absence of expansion. Next slide, please. So Medicaid is not just a function, not just a, a health care and health coverage provider, as most of us on this call think of it. It also plays a vital role in protecting our economy, which is not something that the advocacy community tends to focus on, but it might be something of critical importance to senators right now. Economists tell us that Medicaid is an automatic fiscal stabilizer. What that means is that when the economy is bad and goes downhill, people lose their jobs, people lose their income, automatically more folks go on the Medicaid program, which means that the federal government's matching share of health care costs comes into the state to support the economy. It keeps health care jobs alive. And when that happens, the nurses, doctors, uh, administrative staff of health care providers have paychecks that they spend in grocery stores and gas stations surrounding businesses that multiply or effect that further improves the economy. Researchers have told us that since Medicaid expanded eligibility to include, in the vast majority of states, adults with incomes up to 138% of the federal poverty level without categorical restrictions, the program has become twice as effective in providing automatic support for the economy. Now, the, now all, of, all of that means that we need to maintain Medicaid, but if we can get increased FMAP, increased federal percentage of, of payments as a form of fiscal relief, that makes the Medicaid program even more effective in protecting the U.S. economy. Why is that? Well, number one, at, at the most obvious level, when a laid-off worker gets Medicaid and there's higher FMAP, that means there's more federal dollars that flow into the state to automatically support employment. But more broadly, Higher FMAP raises the percentage of federal dollars that cover Medicaid costs across the entire Medicaid program, not just new enrollees, but previous enrollees as well. So that saves money for the state, and that provides a form of fiscal relief that lets the states avoid major budget cutbacks and increased taxes. Now, what that means is, is as Ellen has reminded us, FMAP increases are a powerful form of state fiscal relief. And unlike the... The, 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 the coronavirus relief funding, the block, the block grant funding to states that are unrestricted in their statutory terms, the FMAP increase gets out there immediately because it uses an existing conduit for funneling federal dollars to states. The states, just every quarter, they submit what their expenses are. The federal government pays its matching share. By contrast, the other funds, which are critically important as well and we strongly support it, are subject to administrative delays and questions. Treasury Department may need to come out with regulations. OMB may need to weigh in. The terms may constrain states' ability to draw down the funds. None of those limits apply in the case of FMAP. If you really want to make sure that states get the money they need to avoid major budget cuts 
in serious, serious fiscal, in serious, in serious economic conditions, ethnic increases are in many ways the absolute best way to go. Now, what, one feature that's really important in that FMAP was translated by Ellen's discussion of the right long-term solution, which is making FMAP changes occur automatically in response to changed fiscal conditions. That means that if a state is having a serious problem deeper than its neighbors, it gets more help. So that could be vital in states like Oklahoma and Texas and Louisiana that depend on the fossil fuel industry. Those are states that are suffering from, from enormous cuts in oil prices alongside the COVID-19 recession that's hit the rest of the country. Um, it also means that the money can continue as long as the adverse economic circumstances are in place. That is so critically important. So the, during the Great Recession, as fabulous as that FMAP increase was, it ended at a defined point in time when two Republican senators from Maine said, you know what, we've done this enough, let's stop. Well, the bad times economically continued to roll, and because the cutback was made arbitrarily rather than in response to economic conditions, there was not enough fiscal relief that went to states. And states cut their spending enormously um, in, uh, uh, following the end of that assistance. And what the Economic Policy Institute has concluded looking at this is that that reduction in state spending that followed the end of federal fiscal relief in the Great Recession was delayed by four years our country's full recovery from the Great Recession. Um, as Ellen indicated, the, all the work that federal policymakers do to, to buff up the economy in these hard times is immediately undercut when the states have no choice but to make budget cuts or raise taxes, given the constitutional requirements they all face, or almost all face, to have balanced budget. Why is that? The federal government keeps the economy going by pumping stimulus out, buying goods and services, keeping people employed. If states make cuts in response, they lay off people, they buy fewer goods and services, that directly undercuts what the federal government does. So uh, it, it, it is the height of foolishness to fail to provide states with adequate fiscal relief. The Economic Policy Institute estimated that we will lose another 5.3 million jobs if we as a country do not provide states and localities with adequate fiscal relief. So the consequences are just enormous. I would point out that the one time the states did not undercut the federal government uh, in over the past half century was following the 1982 recession when the country, despite a really severe double dip recession, recovered really quickly. And at that point in time, uh, under President Reagan uh, and with Speaker Tip O'Neill, they established a system of revenue sharing, general revenue sharing from the federal government to the states that prevented state cutbacks and that helped the economy bounce back. Don't we want the economy to bounce back now? Or would senators prefer to see huge numbers of their constituents without work and having hard times putting food on the table and keeping the lights on? Let's be clear. When COVID-19 hit America's shores a few months ago, we were driven into a twofold crisis. The worst public health emergency that our country has faced in over a century and the deepest, most severe recession we have faced since World War II. By providing FMAP increases and state fiscal relief, Congress can address both halves of that crisis, saving lives and saving jobs. Well, thank That's you it. so much, Stan. Uh, thank you so much, Stan. Um, and now we'll turn it over to Carolina Valle from the California Pan Ethnic Health Network. Great. Can you all hear me? Awesome. Um, well, hi, everybody. I'm, my name is Carolina Baya, and I'm with the California Pan-Ethnic Health Network. Um, and Raven, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. I think I might have accidentally turned the audio on my computer, maybe. Yeah, if everyone, uh, if you could try muting your computer, and then if every speaker could just make sure that they're muted. Okay. Still having the problem. Um, okay, uh, uh, Ashlyn uh, from Ready Talk, are you on? Are you able to troubleshoot our audio issues? You know what, Raven? I just turned the volume down on my own computer, and that might solve the problem. Great. Great. Um, 
Hi. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Carolina. I'm the Senior Policy Manager with the California Pan-Ethnic Health, Net Health Network, and we are a statewide organization here in California. Um, next slide. So CPEN is a coalition of over 40 community-based organizations here in California. Um, we work with a variety of different organizations serving communities of color on the ground. Our community-based organizations do a wide range of services, um, legal assistance, food assistance, mental health services, dental care, um, and other types of basic needs support. Um, and so um, our job at CPEN is really to identify the most pressing issues that our CBOs are facing um, and elevate those issues to our state government. Um, and um, with COVID-19, um, what we have noticed is that the state has really failed to support trusted community-based organizations. Um, there has been an enormous focus on supporting uh, providers um, in the transition to um, telehealth amid COVID-19, and less of a focus on ensuring that community-based organizations have the resources um, to support um, consumers on the ground. Um, and so in, in terms of the big themes that we saw here in California, um, there was confusing guidance from the state to community-based organizations on how they can properly and safely provide care to um, community members. There was a lack of culturally competent information about um, COVID-19. Um, oftentimes, the state um, failed to translate um, basic public health education materials um, for those consumers, um, as well as um, a lack of investment in ensuring that CBOs had the right um, resources to transition to um, virtual care. And the reason that I highlight all of that is because it's really important context for understanding where we need to um, invest funds moving forward. Um, many of our community-based organizations do bill Medi-Cal, um, and so they would benefit from the fiscal relief at the federal level. Um, some additional challenges that our CBOs faced um, is um, just, and more, more broadly, um, because we, we really do need to think about this in sort of the context of the work, um, many of the CBOs that we work with are not just providing, um, you know, billable services, but they're the only providers in their community providing culturally competent services. Um, and so it was really difficult for them to um, transition to the telehealth modality because many of the services are really based on social cohesion. Um, there's also just a really long history of distrust between government institutions and communities, and as well as um, a lack of um, information. And so even when there were opportunities to um, receive uh, relief or um, support, um, those opportunities were often missed um, and, and sort of um, misunderstood. Um, and then um, just a general lack of budget investment in navigation services of CBOs. Um, we here in California have a breadth of organizations that provide sort of traditional Medi-Cal navigation services, but a lot of CBOs um, are providing those type of navigation services um, sort of without the, um, the compensation, um, especially in um, the COVID-19 response. So we had many organizations that in fact um, formed networks of um, public health education uh, materials that were in language because the state um, was not providing them. Um, and then the other big piece um, that is, remains a theme today is um, while there has been greater success in transitioning consumers um, to the telehealth modality um, that are already receiving services and were previously receiving services with their provider, it's been much more difficult um, for those CBOs to transition um, clients um, for the first time who might be new patients or consumers. Next slide. So um, in terms of where we are with our budget here in California, um, you know, the governor has reported a shortfall of about $54 billion um, in response to COVID-19. Um, and um, we have also faced, um, just in terms of process, a truncated process. Um, the legislature shut down here in California because of COVID-19. Um, and so 
Um, it's really been a huge challenge just to advocate at the state level um, to ensure that um, funds are going toward equity-centered programs. Um, May Revise came out on May 15th, and what we saw was um, really just a, an atrocious um, line of cuts to health and human services programs, um, including um, a proposal here in California to expand Medi-Cal for older adults, um, our adult dental benefits, which we only recently uh, restored fully back in 2018, um, cuts to our navigators um, that provide critical care for people um, who need to navigate health insurance, as well as um, the um, Black, Black Infant Health Program, which supports um, uh, uh, maternal mortality rates of, among black communities and uh, among black women and children, um, which um, I'd just like to highlight was the only program that was cut from our um, Department of Public Health. Um, and so uh, the deadline here in California uh, for uh, a budget to be uh, approved was June 15th. Um, and so the budget was uh, approved. Um, and the governor has 12 days uh, to sign it. Um, and so uh, we are still uh, in negotiations, if you will, uh, between the legislature and the governor about what will um, be in that final budget. Um, but regardless, um, and this is what I really like to kind of impose on, on the people um, on this um, webinar today, is that regardless of what um, the uh, governor signs in terms of the budget, it will still be contingent upon federal funding. And so this is why a lot of our advocacy is um, now ramping up um, to uh, uh, target the federal government, uh, pr precisely because um, of the need um, to support FMAP, the increase in FMAP and the maintenance of effort. Um, next slide. Um, so, um, you know, aside from, um, you know, our federal advocacy here in California, uh, because of the shorter legislative cycle due to COVID-19, a lot of our advocacy here in California really shifted to our state departments. So it looked more administrative, um, which was a, a kind of surprising development um, for, um, I think, many organizations in California that are used to doing their advocacy within the legislative process as a budget process. Um, so these are just some examples of administrative letters we wrote to various state departments um, to really ensure that um, California is um, prioritizing equity um, in um, the work that they're doing. Um, you know, we've been afforded many flexibilities, um, and, and while, um, you know, we really need to ensure that providers are able to bill and provide services, um, I think our, our sort of main um, takeaway and our main point is that equity needs to be at the center of all that work. And so ensuring that communities of color, LEP communities, Black, Latinx, LGBT, API communities um, are receiving services in an equitable manner and, not, and that we're not just, persist, uh, we're not just uh, perpetuating the disparities that already exist here in California. So would encourage all of you to take a look at all of our letters if they're helpful for inspiration. Um, in terms of how to think about equity in the COVID-19 response, these are all publicly available and should be links um, in this webinar slide. Um, next slide. So, uh, you know, with California's budget uh, very much contingent on federal funding, um, we've also shifted our advocacy to the federal government. Um, as many of the speakers um, discussed earlier, um, we, uh, you know, are um, very much aware that the existing share of funding um, is really not enough to fill um, the hole here in California, especially when we think about the fact that here in California alone, we can expect to see um, at least 1.7 million new enrollees in Medi-Cal. Um, so we have actually um, started with a lot of education about what FMAP is um, here in California. I think Ellen spoke earlier um, about the importance to do sort of the FMAP 101 with partners, um, and that's really uh, been a crucial component of how we um, have sort of mobilized our coalitions to um, put together a couple of letters um, to uh, federal legislators, um, which I have linked here below. Um, 
you know, we um, feel similarly and have sort of echoed a lot of the things that others have said on this call that, um, you know, the, the 6.2 FMAP is just really not sufficient. Um, you know, we know, um, you know, here in California that we're going to need, need to see something closer, at least to the 14% enhanced FMAP to um, fill that $14 billion hole. So, um, you know, uh, we, um, I think, are, are continuing to do um, sort of the advocacy at the federal level, we followed up directly with Senator Feinstein's office to, re to request their sign-on. Um, we've shared the, our template letter with all of our own partners to make sure they also can send their own additional letters. Um, and, um, you know, we're going to continue to sort of keep the pressure on here at the state level and on the federal level to um, ensure that um, when we come back um, later this summer, when the legislature resumes, um, that we can more confidently um, make sure that we can prevent all of those cuts to health and human services. So um, I think that's it on my end, and I'll pass it back to the facilitator. Great. Thank you, Carolina. Um, and so we're just uh, going to move now into a quick question and answer. Um, just a reminder to folks to please use the chat box to ask your questions. Uh, I think we'll start with a question for Alan and maybe Hemi can chime in as well. Um, so a uh, question is, um, given the conversation among some members and some groups like ALEC and the Heritage Foundation that would advocate against additional state relief, um, who do you see as really strong persuasive messengers to make that credible case for additional state relief and, and an FMAP increase? <clears throat> I'm sorry, like you're saying who are the best messengers for that? Is that I'm sorry, it's yeah. a little fuzzy. Okay. Yeah. Not, so and I, I think specifically for those members that would say that states don't need additional relief. Well, I'd say there's a couple things. Um, most states are we have been projecting aggregate revenue state shortfalls based on a number of things from CBO and Goldman Sachs. Now states are actually putting them out. So as states put out state revenue shortfalls. And as states start to report, which has been um, lagging a little bit, but now we're seeing an increases in Medicaid enrollment and other things, I say, you know, the numbers speak truth to power, right? So if you have evidence in your state at the state or local levels about shortfalls, about higher costs, um, you know, I think that is really hard to refute. Um, yes, there has been a fair amount of, you know, states got $110 billion in CARES, but again, set up against the holes that states are facing um, we should be able to make the point that that wasn't enough. I think on the on the FMAP side, the fact that there is a new informal provider coalition, they if you guys don't, I think I actually added in the resources I gave um, Lauren to send you all, but I don't remember ever working on the FMAP in all these years uh, where you know the Federation of Hospitals and AHIP and Blue Cross and others um, came together exclusively to support an increase in the FMAP and provider voices are very, very important on a bipartisan basis. Now, it is complicated by the provider fund, and the provider fund, as you all know, just made some announcements, uh, or just announced that they would be um, sharing with some of those fundings with those providers. That is one-time money. And so what I actually forgot to send Lauren, um, but I will send over to and, and ask families to share with you all, we did a paper from Judy Solomon about why the provider fund is not a replacement for the FMAP providers, and then we did a one-page talking point. So I think the provider voice um, is very, very important. Um, we are seeing a number of, you know, beyond governors, we've been seeing some state legislators that might be chairs of the budget committee, might be chairs of the health committee, um, so state officials who can lift up and evidence where their costs are going, where the demand is growing, what they're not able to do because of those revenue shortfalls you know, are all really important things. And then the last thing I would say is what I would call is um, outside validators who are important. So for example, I think about 48 hours ago, the Aspen Institute re re, um, uh, unveiled a bipartisan proposal. Jason Furman, who ran the Council of Economic Advisors for under Obama, Glenn Hubbard, who uh, ran CEA under Republican, I think under Bush, um, uh, they released a very, very significant economic recovery plan with massive amounts of state relief. It makes NGA in the center and heroes look like a cheap date. So um, I think their FMAP alone was $600 million. 
those are very important, highly regarded economists across the spectrum. There's a new report out today that Speaker Pelosi has released from Mark Zandi talking about the need for that. So the more we can continue to lift up experts, um, I think that also helps. Hemi may have some other ideas there as well. Yeah, the only thing I would add, um, thank you, Alan, that was um, very eloquent. One thing that we're hearing um, from congressional members and staff is they want to see the data on where states are already spending the money that has already been appropriated. And I think, um, you know, I think all of us are in agreement on this phone call um, that a lot more funding is needed and given the nature of the shortfalls that are so huge, there's no question. But that's just, just a point of reference is, you know, they want to know, like, where are the states spending it? How are they, how are they actually making sure it's going to the right places? How is it helping to, to address some of these shortfalls? And it's a little bit tough because the money is flowing now, and so not all the data is there. There's a couple of states that have some really good, um, interesting dashboards, if anyone's interested, like Rhode Island, where they have mapped out kind of where they're spending their funds and which categories. So just want to highlight that's just kind of a point of, of data that we keep getting asked. Great, thank you. And um, I think that uh, just really quick, I know we're getting close to the hour, um, so if anyone has a comment on this one, um, just a question on prioritization for folks that want to engage with their federal lawmakers. Um, you know, is uh, any thoughts on, um, you know, communications to Republicans only, trusting that Democrats are supportive, um, you know, should we be targeting both on um, House versus Senate? Um, so any, any comments on that before we conclude? Yeah, I'd love to take that. And my short answer is please don't assume Senate Democrats are all over this. Um, please don't make assumptions about, um, about the level of engagement uh, among Senate Democrats. On the House side, you know, they passed the heroes. They had, I, I think every Democrat voted for it. I can't remember. They have a very strong fiscal package. That does not mean that House Democrats have focused on the FMAP per se, although I would say more of them have focused on it um, than in the Senate side. On the Senate side, if you have Democrats in the Senate, it is imperative that they be hearing from you about the importance of the FMAP, that any bipartisan agreement on COVID when it addresses state fiscal relief really needs a combination of the FMAP plus the direct grants and state and local aids, but it is absolutely inadequate and unacceptable for us to end up with a deal where there's a limited pot of money that would be divided between state and local governments. That is basically a guarantee of massive state layoffs and massive state budget cuts. On the Republican side, and I would just note that there are a number of former governors in the House, in the Senate, on, the, on both Republican and Democratic side. They are the ones that understand state budgets. They are the ones that understand the flexibility and efficacy of the FMAP, so engaging them to speak out. Some of them are willing to go public. Some of them may be working behind the scenes. Um, anybody who cares about healthcare coverage and protecting that um, is very important to make sure they're aware of the value of the FMAP. So, you know, other than, for example, you know, Senator Wyden um, is acutely aware of the FMAP, Senator Grassley, you know, they, they know it, right? They, they understand what the issue is. Doesn't mean it doesn't hurt to encourage them. Uh, Senator Casey has really been leading a lot of the FMAP work. Um, Senator Warner from Virginia has just kind of stepped out there. But other than that, I just would not assume that anybody in the Senate um, doesn't need to be hearing more from you about the importance of this. And I would suggest that that, to the degree we can, be done before they go home for the July 4th break. But just to remind everybody, the Senate is home the week of the 6th and the week of the 13th, and then they come back and roll up their sleeves and sit down to negotiate for three very intensive weeks, two or three intensive weeks. So. We want to try to maximize what we do now and then use whatever exposure we can when they're back home to really lift this up. And the House has been great on the FMAP. My family's first, they put it in. It's in Heroes, and we need the House. Um, this is unfortunately Democrats, not Republicans, but we need the House guys to be adamant about insisting that the COVID deal in include, include as much of you know, the, the, the Heroes FMAP as possible. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so we will um, just close with some resources. And again, we'll share these with everyone who is registered um, uh, by email. 
And we also encourage you to join our next webinar on June 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. It's going to be focused on federal and state policy recommendations to address COVID-19 health inequities. Um, we are uh, you know, very grateful to the National Urban League for being our partner on that webinar and also to Senator Catherine Cortez Masto of Nevada for joining us to share remarks. Um, so we encourage you to join. We'll include that information in the follow-up email as well. Um, so thank you again for taking the time um, to join us, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and stay well.